Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is Lecture 54 in the Summer 2020 Offering of EC3084 Signals and Systems. And today I would like to do an example of solving a linear circuit using Laplace transform methods subject to certain initial conditions. So we'll have a 12 volt source, a 4 ohm resistor, an 8 ohm resistor, a 2 Henry inductor, and a 12 ohm resistor. And across the 8 ohm resistor, I'm going to put a switch that closes at t equals zero. So it starts open. And across the inductor and the 12 ohm resistor, I'm going to put a 0.2 farad capacitor. Notice that that's an awfully high capacitance, and this is an awfully high inductance. It's a way bigger capacitance than it is an inductance. And for that matter, these are extremely small resistors. These particular values aren't representative of real-world circuits. That tells you this example came from a textbook. As far as basic circuits textbooks go, I'm a big fan of this book simply titled Circuits by Ulibi and Marabiz. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, by NTS Press. And in particular, I'm a fan of its reasonable price tag. It looks like they have a new edition out with a longer title and an additional author. And if you go to their website and click on this link, you can get a free, legitimate, licensed, non-sketchy PDF of the textbook. They'd like you to fill out something that says what course you might be using the book at and at what university, but they're just keeping track of who might be using it. You can put down anything here. So if you're a student just learning on your own, independent of any university, you can go ahead and do that. So it is really awesome of the authors and their publisher to do this for the community. The particular problem that I'm working in this lecture is from page 661 of this text. I made a few tweaks just to shake things up. For instance, I use a 12 volt source here instead of 24 volt. And I also use 6 volt for the initial condition instead of 12 volts. In my copy of the text, which is a first edition, this problem appears on page 495, which is where I first saw it. Our goal is going to be to find the current through the inductor for t bigger than or equal to zero. The first thing I want to do is find the pre-initial conditions on the current flowing through the inductor and on the voltage across the capacitor, which I'll define with the positive on the upper end here, and I'm defining the arrow going down. You can do either of these going the other direction. You would just get these results with a minus sign. So to get the pre-initial conditions, we think about this case where the switch is open and it's been open for a long time. Whatever was happening in the distance past, everything settled out so that things are now in a quote unquote DC steady state condition. Any transients have died off. And in such conditions, this capacitor looks like an open circuit and the inductor looks like a short circuit. So in those particular conditions, we could use Ohm's law to find the current going this direction. Imagine current coming out of the positive terminal of the voltage source here. And then we can use Ohm's law to write 12 volts divided by 4 ohms plus 8 ohms plus 12 ohms. Let me scoosh everything over to get a little more space. So this gives us 12 volts over 4 plus 8 plus 12 is 24 ohms. Let me scoosh this all over a little bit too, which gives us 0.5 amps. And in case you're wondering, this is an absolutely bonkers amount of amps that will kill you very dead. So be cautious with these things. What about the voltage across the capacitor? Again, in the DC case, this is a open circuit and this is a short. So I can write this as a voltage divider. I have this same sequence of resistances in the denominator. So let me just copy that over. But of course, to make this voltage divider work, I need to put the resistance that I'm dropping voltage over in the numerator. By assuming I've already found the precondition on this current, 
I could realize I've already computed this. It's just 0.5 amps. So I take half of 12 volts, which gives me 6 volts. Similarly, if I had computed the voltage here first, I could have used Ohm's law and said that the current through the inductor is going to be the same as the current through the resistor here. So that's going to be 6 volts divided by the resistance of 12 ohms, which gives me that 0.5 amps. So that's just a double check. So let's draw a Laplace equivalent for this circuit for the T bigger than or zero case. Once the switch is flipped, the 8 ohm resistor is bypassed. I'll have a 4 ohm resistor here. This is the most boring Laplace equivalent component that we have. When we think about what's happening with this 12 volt battery in the time domain, in this Laplace framework, it's best to think of it as having a UT attached to it because that's what our unilateral Laplace transforms know how to deal with. So I'm going to draw this as having a Laplace transform of 12 over S. We'll also have a fairly boring 12 ohm resistor down here. So now we need to think about what equivalent model we would like to use for the inductor and the capacitor. So pulling over our handy dandy sheet of equivalent circuits, I see for the capacitor I have the choice of a series model or a parallel model, and similarly for the inductor. I'm going to try to solve this circuit using the mesh current method. So I would like to pick whatever avoids creating new meshes so I'll pick the series model for each of these cases. So let's tackle the inductor first. I have an inductance of two Henrys. So according to this formula, we'll have a series combination. The element on top here is an inductance of SL. So I'll write us as having an inductance of 2S. Here I'm using an inductance symbol. You could also use a box if you want. I'll quite often just go ahead and write an inductor, or if I have an impedance of 1 over S times some constant, I'll write a capacitor symbol. But of course, a box would be perfectly fine as well. And if you have any more complicated impedance expression, you can't write an inductor symbol or a capacitor symbol. You really need to use a box. It's a matter of personal taste. Okay, so what is in series with it? Well, I'll have this voltage source with the negative on top, and the voltage is going to be the inductance times the initial condition. So I'll have two Henry's times one half, which is the number of amps I have here, which gives me one. So what about my 0.2 farad capacitor here? According to my handy dandy sheet, I'll have an equivalent circuit with an impedance of one over SC. So that will be an impedance of five over S because 5 is 1 over 0 0.2. And since I have a 1 over S here, I'll draw this impedance using a capacitor symbol. We could also use a box if we wanted. And then we'll have a voltage source in series. But unlike the case with the inductance model, this one has the plus going upward. And the voltage is going to be the pre-initial condition voltage, which is 6 over S. One thing you might note is that although I drew little ohm symbols next to these numbers, I didn't write down units on anything else. That's because units in these Laplace equivalent circuits get a little weird. I just went through a stack of a half dozen circuits text, and if you look at all of their Laplace transform chapters, none of them include units on things like this. You won't see units sitting anywhere. Some of the textbooks will even leave out these ohms, so they're consistently avoiding writing units all over the place. And I think the main issue is that once you start having S's in all these different places, the units do get a little strange in order to make everything to work out. It's not that every single number we write is suddenly dimensionless. It's just very tricky to keep track of all of the different variations of units that wind up piling on top of each other. So my advice is just make sure you're consistently using ohms, henrys, farads, volts, and amps.
and it will work out fine. I'm going to try solving these using the mesh current method. So I'll define a I1 using capital I because we're in Laplace land. Here I'll have it go clockwise and I'll define an I2 also going clockwise. And you could have either of these going either direction you want. As long as you're careful and consistent, you'll eventually get the correct answer. I always have to be extra careful when using the mesh current method because I have much less practice with it than I do the node voltage method. I tend to just like the node voltage version better. I find that if I write down some current arrows, I have an easier time envisioning the various currents flowing into and out of a node with the node voltage method than I do trying to visualize what's happening in the mesh current method because at least with the node voltages, each node is sort of doing its own thing. Whereas with the mesh current method, you have to always think about these little zones where your meshes overlap and trying to get some intuition about while thinking about the way these meshes superimpose over each other, I find to be very difficult. Also, I do a lot of work with op amp circuits and those are most naturally analyzed using the node voltage method. But let's go ahead and use the mesh current method here. So I'm going to follow the current arrow around and say that I have a voltage rise of 12 over S. And then as I'm going around, I could also see that I have another voltage rise that's this one. So at this point, there would be a couple of ways to think about it. I could subtract a bunch of voltage drops or alternatively, I could say that I put all the voltage rises on one side of the equation, and then I'll put the voltage drops on the other side of the equation. And I'll write four times I1. And normally I would put the S here, but to keep things compact, I'm going to suppress the S notation. And then I'll have a 2S plus 12, and that's these two elements that I'm adding together because they're in series. And those will get multiplied by I1, but I'll also need to subtract I2 because I have an I2 that's pushing against the I1. That's one of my mesh equations. Now for I2, I'll think about that a little bit differently. If I imagine running around the mesh here, notice I'm going from plus to minus and plus to minus. So thinking about following along with the current arrow, those would be voltage drops. And then I have voltage drops across everything here. So so I could just say that my voltage rises are zero, and then I'll put all of these drops over here. Your mileage may vary. You could do this a whole bunch of different ways. Let me start up here, and then I'll move clockwise. So I'll have five over S times I2 plus six over S, and then I'll have a 12 plus two S times I2 minus I1 with the I1 pressing against I2. And then I'll also drop one. Again, there's many ways to think about this as you're running around the circle. They all wind up being algebraically equivalent in the end. And now for the fun part, which is solving for I1 and I2. I won't slog through the details here in Adobe Sketchbook, but I did slog through them previously using pencil and paper, and I scanned that and it looked a little something like this. I rewrote both of the equations to group all the terms multiplying I1 together and all the terms multiplying I2 together, and then put all of the stuff that doesn't have an I1 or an I2 on the other side in order to set up a matrix equation that I could solve. Now we don't need to use the fancy matrix theory if you want. You could instead solve both of the equations for say I1, equate them to get I2, then plug that back in to get I1, or you could solve them both in terms of I2, equate them, solve for I1, and then get the result and plug that back in to get I2. Either way, you have a bunch of painful algebra ahead. So the traditional way of solving such a two by two equation is to first compute the determinant. So I'd multiply the upper left and lower right elements, and then subtract the result of multiplying the lower left and the upper right elements, and then do a bunch of algebra to find the determinant. Then to take the two by two matrix inverse, we swap the diagonal elements, 
and then we keep the off diagonal elements where they are, but we put minus signs on them, divide by the determinant, and then multiply that by the column of constants, and we wind up doing a ton of math. So much algebra, even more algebra. We multiply things out, we cancel things. It was really painful, but I did it. All right, so the current through the inductor is I1 minus I2, which is the current flowing the opposite direction. And when we subtract those, we wind up with this expression for the current through the inductor in the Laplace domain. We have one pole at zero, two other poles that we can find with the quadratic formula, both of which are real. So we can compute the partial fraction expansion, and I'm not going to slog through the details of that. But here's the coefficient for the pole at the origin. And then we can find the other partial fraction expansion coefficients, plug those into the appropriate spots, and then our final answer for the current has a constant minus a decaying exponential, and then we'll add to that a exponential that's decaying faster. I'll, of course, time some step function the way you traditionally write it, but emphasizing this is only valid for t bigger than or equal to zero, and we're remaining agnostic as to what might have been happening for t less than zero. Notice that if you plug in zero for t, you wind up getting 0.5 amps, which is helpful because that matches our pre-initial condition on the current. We can do a bit of a sanity check earlier in the calculations by multiplying the current in the Laplace domain by s, then taking the limit as s goes to infinity. And according to the initial value theorem, this should give us what the current looks like as it approaches zero from the right. Let's see, the s's would cancel, and then as s is going to infinity, this constant term will get swapped, and these terms in terms of just an s will get swapped. These s square terms will dominate, and they'll kind of cancel each other, and then the fours will cancel, and then we'll be left with one half, which conveniently matches both the pre-initial condition and the value at t equals zero we found from inverting our partial fraction expansion. So everything winds up lining up happily. Basically, whenever you have one of these switching circuits and you're switching from one kind of circuit configuration to another, it's the electric field in the capacitor in the form of the voltage across it, and it's the magnetic field in the inductor in terms of the current running through it, which encapsulate all of the information about the history of the circuit that we need to figure out what happens going forward after the switch is flipped.